Well, you've seen it. And that means you better believe it. What you're seeing right here right now is 100% bona fide believability, baby. It's Malcolm Tent, bass player and minister of propaganda for Anti-Scene Incorporated, bringing you the latest episode of the Anti-Scene Shoot interview series. We are on an epic voyage through the career of the one and only Mad Brother Ward, longtime fan, ally, friend, and now guitar player for Anti-Scene for the last number of years. And um, if you guys have been following the Shoot Interview series on Facebook, and of course on the Anti-Scene YouTube channel, Anti-Scene Official, you've seen a few hours of me and Brad, Mad Brother Ward uh, shooting the fat, chewing the... Well, never mind. We've been talking about this stuff for a long time. And now we're at the point where we're going to actually get right down into the, the brass gritty, the nitty tacks of the anti-scene discography that Mad Brother Ward is a participant of. So why don't we just stop listening to me and start listening to my guest once again, Mad Brother Ward. What's up, Mad Brother? All right. What's up, Malcolm? Is the uh, shine too bright off my noggin? Uh. Yeah, you got a really you got a nice gleam there. I think you're you're looking yep, light, bright, and uh light and bright. <laughs> what I gotta work with. Yeah, that's it, man. That's it. So yeah, it's it's been quite the 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 journey we've gone on so far. We've been talking about your your background with anti-scene for three hours already, and it's been awesome the whole time. I've learned a lot and the people are responding positively and it's going really well. So just in like the absolute most basic nutshell, we've traced your career from, I'll reach over here and grab this record from your past life as Mad Brother Ward from Mad Brother Ward and the Screaming Street Trash. You did a couple of seven inchers, eight live shows and some various other releases that put you on the map forever, notwithstanding the fact that this launched you directly into your trajectory with anti-scene. So it began here. It is where it is now. And now we're going to talk about, talk about the records. And I, the... I was going to say, I figure just the best place to start. So I'm on a roll, man. I'm on a roll. Would be, and correct me if I'm wrong, your first involvement with a proper anti-scene release would be this compilation. Am I correct? You are correct. I All think right. the uh, first act of involvement was I helped compile this with Jeff. Um, I, uh, as far as the compilation, as far as picking songs and stuff, um, I'm, I can't remember what it is. There was a couple that I, I really like pushed hard for saying, you know, hey, we you ought to include this, but out of selfish reasoning, but um, I can't remember. I can't remember which ones. Uh, but the big thing that I was really proud of was on the um, inner booklet there. I wrote the uh, liner notes. So if you got that, and you, if you've ever read one of my blogs and go, "Ooh, that's kind of strangely familiar." Yes, indeed. The Mad Brother has hath protested much on episodes of the shoot interview that he's he's a writer, not a talker. And, yeah. Um, this was this is my first experience with Mad Brother Ward was reading the booklet to the uh, anti scene best of double CD. I think, I think it's great. I've enjoyed this very much, and um, I actually called upon your archival bent many years ago before I, you know, joined the band or recorded anything. Um, I was going to do a version of Animals Eat em as part of my solo acoustic set. And I was like, I can't figure out all the lyrics. Who do I ask? I'll ask Ward. And sure enough, you got me the lyrics, man. I, I recall that. I remember that happening. That was that was probably around roughly the same time. Um, did, did we want to go into any of these as a, as a back, background on any of this Mad Brother Ward stuff at all? 
Mm, I would invite the listener to watch some of our previous uh, previous episodes. Of Brother Ward. Yeah, because we, we got exhaustively into the history of Mad Brother Ward and the Scream and Street Crash and your career as a roadie driver, merch guy in general, bon vivant. I've gotten lost at where we're at. So yeah, we'll pick up we'll pick up the thread here when I started being involved in anti scene releases. So obviously, like we said, best of CD. Uh, I went with Jeff when he went to have this mastered, and um, that was kind of cool because um, you don't usually get to go involved, you know, you be involved in stuff like that. And uh, you know, it's of course it's been God fifteen what almost 15 years ago so it's what is that 2008 that's not quite 15 years ago 12 years ago whatever it is 13 years ago i can't remember um but you know we did i did a bunch of drafts on that liner notes thing and finally we got together and so i was really i was really proud of it i thought it was really cool to be finally you know helping in a way you know what i mean to get yeah totally and when you when you mention the mastering it's a very well mastered package like everything sounds very consistent like all the levels all the sounds it's got a lot of punch to it yeah they were they worked on that and uh it was interesting to watch it was a you know it's it's not exciting stuff but it's not something you see every day you know i love it myself i, I love being in the studio and i know jeff has talked about it in the past but he doesn't he doesn't like the studio i love it uh, when it comes to the recording process, I'll do take after take. I'll, I'll hang around and watch everybody else. I, I really enjoy the studio environment. I think it just depends on my mood as to how much I like it. Um, we'll, we'll get into that as we as we progress here. Um, before I was a member of NIC, the first thing that I got to do directly with Jeff um, as a, in, a, in a band environment or whatever you want to call it was Jeff Clayton and the Mongrels. Is that too much light on that? Can y'all see that? Too much yeah, shine? Look, looks fine, man. It's not, not as shiny as your dome, so it's yeah. okay. Yeah. Oh, we're good. Then we're good. And we did a, the, the uh, we, 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 this came together because um, at one point there was a lineup shift in the band, and that as, as it goes, and Jeff was wanting to stay busy. And I suggested he do another Slime Goats record. I was like, why don't you get some guys into a Slime, you know, because I always loved that Slime Goats record. And uh, I'm like, you know, and give yourself some elbow room maybe to do something a little, maybe a little stylistically different or whatever, you know, not not radical, but, you know, it wouldn't be necessarily just hammered down to the, you know, three chord, bar chord kind of structure. And um, he seemed a little, I don't, I don't know, I don't think the word, I don't know what the word would be. He, you know, not ambivalent, but a little unsure of it, whether or not that'd be a good idea or whatever. And then we kind of talked about it and um, I was like, well, I'll see if I can find some people that might be interested. So we started, you know, I started getting in touch with people and um, we ended up with some um, guys that um, have been playing music in Charlotte for years, in particular, a guy named Mike Hendricks kind of a local legend in Charlotte played in this rockabilly band called Belmont Playboys, but he has a history that goes back to the late seventies, I think. Um, the, um, he had the group, um, uh, God, my, my brain slipping, no rock stars. Oh, right. They, uh, the, no, I think they're on the no core cassette, that famous cassette. I think they're on that. Really hard. Um, and, but he, you know, he's gone on doing all kinds of things and is really awesome musician and stuff. And I was like, he kind of fell in last. I had a different guy in mind to play guitar and uh, he was being real kind of, you know, weaselly about it. And finally it was just like, oh, okay, well, you know, never mind. Uh, the bass player was a guy named Jimmy King who was in the, uh, he was playing bass in the first, the, the first punk show I ever went to. Uh, there was a band called Misguided Youth and he'd been the bass player in that, you know, so he goes back years and years, you know, in Charlotte, got to do a lot of cool stuff. And uh, we just started uh, kind of throwing a set together that was kind of like we, 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 we uh, reworked uh, some anti scene songs and we did some covers, uh, did some like, you know, Johnny Thunder song and a Ramon song and just some standard stuff. And, you know, we played some shows and had a, it was pretty good time. And, um, Somewhere we got the idea that we should record some of it, and that's how this came together. And uh, trying to choose the songs, um, we, we, we narrowed it down to five 
that we wanted to try to record and then had to figure out which songs are going to get on the record. And what ended up happening was um, three of the songs made on the record, which was this, the A side was a reworking of the song War Hero, the old anti scene song. And um, that turned out really fucking cool. I was really happy with that. That was kind of my arrangement, but I couldn't figure out how to articulate it because I'm, you know, I'm kind of, I don't even know how Jeff involved me in playing guitar on this, but he was, he was like, you, you can play second guitar. And I was going like, Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, you know, I think it helped with some ideas because once I kind of hummed the idea and the, you know, kind of described what I wanted to do to Mike, he could pick it up just like that. And it came out perfect. So it's a it's a lot different than the anti scene version, but it's still really powerful, and really strong, and really cool. Jeff does this really great soulful vocal on it, um, and it it just turned out really amazing. I'm just you know, it's one of the best things I ever got to be involved in. Uh, what made it also cool is we did a version of the song "Need It Bad," uh, "Need It Bad," which is a Mad Brother Ward song. It's on the second Mad Brother Ward record, and um, we did a ver you know did our version of that. And we did a song called If I Had a Thousand Dollars, I'd Be a Millionaire. This is the second time of three times that we've done, that Jeff's done a recording of that. The original was with the band called Rupture from Australia, which all the songs he did with that band, I forget where you find that, but it's really good. It's worth finding. But um, he, you know, he really liked that song a lot and he wanted to do it again. So we did it again on this. And we also did a Simon Stokes song called Wolfpack Rides the Night and um, in a cover of the uh, Sonic Psycho. And uh, those are on a download card that came with the record so you could get all five songs, you know, the old proverbial download card. So that stuff's all out there floating around somewhere, I'm sure, if you look hard, hard enough. And uh, it's worth finding, I think, because... Uh, I'm really proud of that. It was a cool little record to be involved in. We recorded that in a guy's house, and uh, he was recording it to uh, to tape, but then he somehow he transferred it to digital and then tried to have it mastered off that. So we were a little upset about that because there was some snafu. I, I, I don't remember the details in that because I wasn't involved in that part, but... Um, the actual recording of it, it, we recorded it real quick. We uh, set up the drums in the guy's living room. And I think we recorded, it was, I think it, it, my memory is we recorded the drums and my guitar at the same time. I played for him to play too. And then I went and doubled my guitar and then I was done. And then they did the rest, but we did it all in the same night. So it went real fast. It was another one of those deals where it was just like, get in, captured the lightning in the bottle. And somehow we pulled it off and, uh, I can remember watching Mike do his lead for War Hero, and uh, when he got done, we were, it, it, you know, we all kind of got quiet for a minute, and then we were all like, "Yeah!" You know, we thought it was the it was the coolest thing. There's a little mistake in it or something, but it just had such a right vibe. You know, I remember he's going, "Ah, but I fucked up that one part," and we were like, "Man, the vibe was there, and it was so fucking good." So we left it, and it was like he just nailed it in like that first take, if I remember right. But. Um, it was a fun thing to do, and I, I think this record's really killer. I really am happy with it. So, yeah. if Clayton and the Mongols, that was my first active involvement where me and Jeff were in a band together. Right on. Yeah, a lot, a lot of interest in that one. Uh, a lot of clamor for a reissue of it, which I would add my voice to. I don't know who's responsible for that, but reissue, please. I'm on board. Whoever, whoever makes those decisions, I'm not the boss. You have to talk to the uh, unimpeachable press. Um, so forwarding off of that, you know, um, he got, you know, of course, obviously, and I seen recycled the rhythm section, Barry came back in and, uh, you know, they were doing their thing for a while. And then of course, uh, I guess we've talked about, you know, the transition and how I came in when Joe passed away. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so we got to getting busy on, you know, initially it was just learning what we could and that came together really fast and uh, so we started eyeballing the you know recording pro you know coming up with new stuff to record and um, the very first thing that we did was um, or the first thing that we released 
that I was on was a compilation that came with this fanzine, uh, which I can't even read the title of it. If someone can decipher that, that's on them. I'm pretty sure this was the fanzine it came with. I can't find the CD for some reason, which is driving me nuts. But um, it was a compilation, and I think the came through, I know something to do with Backwoods Butcher, and uh, I think it was called Invocation of Obscene Gods. But we did a live version of Last Days on Earth because we were actually, it wasn't legit live. It was live in the studio, so to speak. We actually recorded this at Tremont Music Hall where we were practicing at the time. And uh, Barry thought, you know, there were certain songs that, you know, we had been playing for maybe a year at that point. I don't even think that long. And there were certain songs that he felt like we were doing really strong and felt really good. He just wanted to get some versions done that we just recorded, you know, live at practice or whatever. And that's where that came from. And uh, so that's how that was the very first thing that came out. It was the, and I think if I remember right, we did that the day we recorded the, uh, the very first stuff that I recorded with them, which I believe became the uh, split with uh, he who cannot be named. It's the, Rusty Knuckles split, the he who on one side and us on the other is Jeff. The uh, artwork on this was uh, like, this was painted in uh, Jeff's blood, like Jeff, like, you know, drew blood and then the guy painted it using the blood. So it's a blood portrait. Is that which by is, our friend, uh, Ryan Gillikin? Was, yeah, Ryan Gillikin did that. And it's amazing art. I mean, look at that. It's, that's some pretty cool stuff. And, um, we did, let's see, what did we do on this record? This was the original Let the Working Man Rest a Little Bit. And uh, and then once again, we recorded If I Had a Thousand Dollars, because Jeff loves that song. And this was a cool record though, man. Uh, it came with a cool little insert picture on the inside. And uh, there's the he who side. And the uh, guy that did it, the Rusty Knuckles guy, had it done on three different colors of vinyl, which, you know, if you're a record collector nerd, is always cool. And let me get this sorted where y'all can see it. We got red, white, and blue vinyl. Uh, is that, yeah, can, you, can you see them? Is it visible? Oh, yeah, very. Okay. So red, white, and blue. And I, I did you make sure I got one of each? I went ahead and bought my own. And I remember Jeff was like, we you bought them? And I was like, yeah, I didn't want to miss out. <laughs> I was like, but, you know, it's a big deal for me because this was the first record I got to do with the band, you know, and, and they were doing three different colors of vinyl and the whole, you know, the whole nine yards, you know. Yeah. So this was this was a big deal for me. And I, I you know, it's still kind of cool to, you know, to, to kind of hold this in your hand and be like, wow, you know. That first one where you come out of the gate is just like, you know, there's nothing one, there's, you know, it's nothing quite like it. And I mean, I've done a couple of records of my own, but, you know, it was kind of like stepping up a level, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Well, we'll be addressing that in a, in a little while with another release. Uh, I'm not going to be the spoiler, but I, I can relate. And we'll, we'll talk about <laughs> that a little bit. And I, I will also, I'm going to uh, jump in for just a second. Barry, Sir Barry Hannibal, the general of Anti Scene, told me the story of how that song was written let the working man rest a little bit do you know that one you must no i don't i you know here's how i remember the first time i heard the song he had a demo of it and i believe joe plays guitar on the demo uh he had a, he had a couple of songs that he had demoed but i remember that one jumping off i remember the first here again this is my memory of it back when i was still just help helping i was the you know the roadie guy or whatever I want to say we were in Kansas City, and it was uh, one morning we were kind of, you know, that morning call when we're trying to get everybody into the van, and we were waiting, and uh, Barry played it for me in the van, but um, it, I don't remember what the story is behind how he put it together. If you got a story. I got a story. Sure. Uh, related by Sir Barry himself. He said that um, there was one evening when he was just feeling really restless and wanted to write some stuff, but he wanted some ideas from Jeff Clayton. So he texted him and said, JC, I want to write a song. Come on, give me something. And JC wrote, come on now, let the working man rest a little bit. 
That's right. I remember that now. And yeah, and he, he, he was being for real, letting leave me alone. And Barry was like, ah, but there's a song there. It's great. And that, that was part of the set when I first joined the band. I love that song. I yeah, mean, it was, that's a, that, you know what? I, it, I really like playing it. It, it. it was a little weird for me to learn at first. I mean, it's like one of those songs where at first I'm kind of going, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a little weird. But um, yeah, I, I like playing it. That's a, it's one of my favorites. And then, you know, we did the thousand dollars. And I uh, thought that turned out pretty good, too. We recorded that. It sounds a little different than the other records. I had a different kind of setup going at the time. But um, I remember we, we I want to say we had to do it two different times because we were recording at the club at the, the old Tremont Music Hall, which has since been torn down. But we got to, we weren't set up on the stage. We were actually set up on the floor in front of the stage. They had two rooms. They had a big room and a small room. And even the small room was still pretty large. We were in the small room and we, we were set up on the floor. I think Gooch was on the, on the stage. And I know that's where we tracked all the drums, but I was on the floor doing the guitar. And for some reason we weren't happy with it. So we took it back into the offices where they, you know, when they had a room, you know, little cadre of offices or whatever, they had a kind of empty room and I, set up in there and it turned out really really good and i i still think that's the you know probably the strongest that they, you know i've gotten the guitar to sound so far but um like i said it's a little different because i was using a little bit different stuff right there at the initial onset and you know the time frame here gets a little blurry now even though it's only been like seven years or whatever but um you know that was the that was the first the first thing that got us out of the gate so you know it's it's cool to have, you know, it's, it was, it was pretty exciting when that first record came in. And, you know, like I said, they all thought it was crazy because I actually bought my own copies, you know, it's like, there's no way I was going to miss out on getting them all. So. No, definitely. I can, believe me, I can relate. I'm, I too, I'm not just a bass player. I'm a fan. So believe me, I know. So that's how that got started. Uh, and where do we go from here? I'm trying to remember. See, even I get lost. Um, I want to say the next thing was then we started going into the, um, the uh oh yeah the uh, we're number one stuff and what 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 sort of exotic pressing is that that you have in your hand there? well before i get to the exotic pressing i'll tell a little bit of the backstory we sat down i remember we were like we need to really sit down and concentrate on writing you know new songs and try to get it towards a new album and i think that was the original idea but the way this the way we work it's like you kind of get the, the idea it's like right now we're writing songs and I'm not exactly sure what direction we're going to go with, you know, where, where these songs are going to wind up. You know, the idea is I'm writing for what is potentially the next full length, but sometimes something will pop up and there's some other idea that's like, Oh, well, we could do this now and get on it. And, you know, so that's how kind of what happened. I think here was, um, we were working on some songs and I can remember one of the first ones that um, we wrote was a song called cousin Eddie that Jeff had the idea for. And he kind of had the whole, he had it all worked out in his head and he was kind of like explaining to us what he wanted and how, and we did that at my old house where I used to live. He came, they came over one afternoon and I can remember we sat down, you know, had a little practice amps and started doodling away on that. And that was kind of, that was a lot of fun. I just remember that as being really a, a fun experience to start writing, you know, you know, this is the first time I was actively involved in writing stuff now, you know, because the, with the other record that was like, it preexisted my time. So it was like, we had that and we got that going to let the working man, so, you know, the working man song happened, but that was before I had actually joined. He already had the song. So we just worked on that and we're moving forward. Now we're working on stuff where I can actually, contribute so that was really exciting for me you know in that in that context and um so that became the first towards uh what became the we're number one record um which turned out to be a four song 12 inch ep uh i wrote the song uh, fight like apes or the music for fight like apes jeff and barry wrote the lyrics which is you know that kind of gave it the direction we started going with which was sort of a planet of the apes kind of concept thing um, I had a I had music for the favors are over. The title the favors are over came from an old anti scene song that I believe became the music for the old anti scene song became violence now 
for GG, for the Gigi Allen record, the Murder Jackies record. But it was originally an old anti scene song called Favors Are Over that they never did anything with. And somewhere I heard that and that song title stuck in my head. And I was like, we need to reuse that song title, you know? And I had the music and I came up with some of the lyrics. And I think Jeff came up with some lyrics. So, you know, it was like just sort of putting ideas together and then you come out with something. Uh, the Cousin Eddie song, like I said, just came real fast one afternoon. He had these really funny lyrics. It's a true story about, I guess, somebody he knew or was related to or something. Lo-fi. That came out real. Uh, that was one of those deals where we were at practice, and I'm just playing my guitar kind of aimlessly, and I'm just playing a riff, just not even really thinking about it, and, and, and just like, what, what are you doing there? You know, what is that? And we started kind of bouncing the idea and that song wrote itself in an afternoon. And I, that was super exciting to be a part of because, you know, when you got everybody working together and moving towards the same direction and, you know, it's, it was just, you know, it's not stuff that you, you, you know, it's nothing I got to do with them before, you know, and I'm like, we're, we're we keep moving in this direction. So it came out, pretty great but before we had it ready to go we ran off we were getting ready to go to europe for our first europe tour and that's what you're talking about this this is the first earliest edition of what became the we're number one record and uh we had 50 pressed and as you can see it's the green they were all green marble like this if i remember right and um we took these to Europe, and I think they were pretty much all gone the first night. I mean, they sold like like that. They were gone. And uh, I've seen these pop up on, people have been sharing that they've been popping up on uh, eBay, and people are asking like an obscene amount of money for them. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat, but I don't think I'd want to pay that much. But it's got the little, what do they call that? Kind of like a semi-obi. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, so... That was only available in Europe. It's the only place you could have got them. We have no more. Don't even ask because they don't. That's the. That was it. Yeah, man, got mine. I ain't parting with it. So yeah. And those were out first before we actually had the finished record out, which became, of course, we're number one. Yeah, one hell of a package on the we're number one too. This was like really crazy exciting because. What happened was we were playing a show and uh, uh, Jamie Vita did a, uh, a flyer for it and it was set up like a planted. It was set up like a kind of a comic strip. It was, you know, a five or six panel comic strip where we're beating up the apes on Planet of the Apes. And that turned into an idea where we're like, hey, maybe we can get them to do a whole comic book. Now, my idea in my head while they were talking about this and putting this together was that it was going to be like a zine-sized photocopy stapled together, you know. But what it is, is this. And it's amazing. I mean, he really went, I mean, it's black and white, but it's still, the art was great. Uh, Barry wrote the story, I believe story is hilarious it's pretty funny there's some really funny stuff in there uh you know yeah this is this you got is the you got the the uh uh and i seen doppelganger eight uh imposters you got you know the whole the whole thing so yeah and then barry was telling me i never even really noticed them loosely based on uh kiss meets the phantom there's some, yeah, there's, I was going to say, there's some uh, reference points to Kiss Meets the Phantom. Uh, there's a cameo appearance by, uh, this is well, important you know, to we note. Shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't be the spoiler. I mean, this, uh, is, well, yeah. this is really good. People need this. It, you you got to go find it. If you haven't got it, get it. And what was also cool about it was uh, TKO, Mark Rainey, it works with uh, Cascade Pressing and pretty much can do anything now. And he did a continuous run of vinyl that just the color would change gradually. So there's really no two records that are exactly alike. Um, 
I mean, you'll get a certain run of a certain kind of similar color, but eventually, you know, it kind of just, it just ranges from one thing to the next. So, yeah, as, as we can see, we just saw your, yours, this is mine, yeah. your, yours is like lime green, mine is kind of like this plum color, no two are alike. Yeah, that's, uh, I just thought, you know, the way he put this together, it's just, this is flat out killer. I mean, yeah, it's even got a um, bonus sticker. I mean, just little, little yeah. snacks and, and gimmies like this that really put it over the top with the packaging. But, you know, um, a, a big influence, I think, with the packaging for us came from, you know, we all grew up being, you know, Kiss nerds. And the fun thing about the old Kiss records is they always had goodies inside. Yeah. So it's like now we kind of think in terms of, okay, you know, if you're doing vinyl, what can you add that gives more value for, for the, you know, whoever's buying it. So that's the stuff that we think about now in addition. I mean, obviously the music's very important and very, you know, but to have the other stuff is just kind of makes it a lot more fun, so. Yeah, it puts it right over the top. And, you know, once again, being a collector, this is the kind of things we love. And I, th I think too, this might, this might be the best portrait of the band ever. That's just a great shot. Yeah, that guy came in and did a lot of really good shots with the, with the stuff that day. That picture was inspired by that uh, Almond Brothers cover shot where they're in front of all their road cases. I was like, hey, we ought to do something like that. And we drug all the road cases together. See, I was going to guess the who, who are you? With Keith. Yeah, th well, that's part of it too. You see, instead of not to be taken away, he's got written here to stay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so see, these are the things we, we record geeks and nerds pay attention to. Yeah, we were, we were cognizant of that. So, yeah, that's our who reference in that for sure. Nice. Love it. That's a very auspicious 12 inch debut, sir. Yeah, I, you know, I, I really love that song, Fight Like Apes. I wish we'd play it more. It's, it's a Man. little tricky. The timing in it's a little tricky. We played it at the, uh, not the Halloween show, but the, the uh, quarantine. Yeah, be that to still like I'll, I'll I'll watch the video of the, the first quarantine whenever when we go into fight like apes it's still goosebump city man it was so good yeah I love that song I, I always enjoy playing low fi so that's a lot of fun to play live I want to say that the fight like ape song was the first thing I wrote for the band though that was the first time I sat down and you know and I was like I don't know if this really sounds like like when we first sat down like I said that first time when we sat down we're consciously writing together and Jeff was real adamant he goes just forget what you think the band, sh the band should be and bring what you got because we'll make it us. No matter what you got, you know, once we get done with it, it'll be an anti-scene song. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. I mean, because it has, it, it's kind of like taking any substance and having to put it through the strainer and then whatever comes out is the pure essence of what it is you put through the strainer. And I love Fight Like Apes because it's in a different key. You know, anti scene has got the magic key that a lot of the songs are written in mm -hmm. without revealing any surprises or secrets. Uh, Fight Like Apes is in a whole different key. So when we play it, it's got that extra dramatic punch to it. it sounds good. And see, I wouldn't have been, I would never have considered that before because it just didn't go into my brain that way. So that's why it came out probably the way it did. And that, you know, that also speaks to like a lot of the cover songs that we do is that, you know, by the time it goes through us and the way we interpret it and the way we do things, it really is our song by the time we get done with it, if that makes any sense. That makes perfect sense. And they're like, to this day, there are certain songs I'll hear by somebody else and like 30 or so seconds into it, I'll think, man, that could be an anti-scene song. And I know it's, it's not my call. It's just an idea. Like I'm still fixated on this Randy Newman song called My Old Kentucky Home which if you listen to it, it's like the chord changes, the lyrics. I hear anti-scene doing it clear as a bell in my mind. Maybe you know, I'll, I'll keep lobbying for it. Well, you never know. You never know. It's always a possibility. I'm real out of it, though, about like, you know, and I was talking about this with Barry the other day. I'm like, you know, if we're making a new record, I do this every time. If we're making a new record, it's got to be all originals. It's got to be all originals. Because the anti scene's never, I don't think they've ever made a full, an LP that had 100% all new stuff. It either had at least one cover or a re-recording of a song previous, you know. And, and, the, and the logic in that, there's, you know, there's a reason for it. It's not, it's not laziness. Um, a lot of it has to do with like, and this goes back to like when they did Noise for the Second Noise. Sometimes you would make a record and it's it's such a limited single that you can't not every it doesn't get around. 
and you're going to get a higher press on a vinyl, you know, on a 12 inch record, they will get a higher distribution or whatever. And so maybe, you know, like what, what the, let the working man rest a little bit, you know, if there's 500 of those, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to find, let's do it, do it again on a record where more people will hear it and it'll get, you know, does that make sense? I don't know if I'm saying it right, but. No, it makes sure you want wider availability. And yeah, it's, it has to do with availability and, and, you know, accessibility or whatever. And plus I would think too, with different lineup changes and whatnot, you get different players in and different approaches to a song and maybe it'll change, it'll morph. And you want people to hear the new version of the song and what a song possibly could be that it wasn't before, you know? Yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, I'm sure that probably has something to do with it too. Yeah, but I mean, um, I think, you know, Frank Zappa. I mean, how many times did he record "Trouble Every Day"? You know, how many times did Sun Ra record "Saturn"? You know, the song, different songs reappear constantly throughout their catalogs, and they're always just a little bit different, a little bit reworked. All good. Yeah, that makes it sound like we're evolving. Well, I, I would not want to make any accusations. We're devolving. There you go. <laughs> now you're talking my language. Yeah, I know. Now we're good. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, so moving along, uh, we got, and I'm hoping I'm in the right order here, but that's when we started, you know, after we got through with we're number one, again, it was like, okay, we need to really get down on doing a full length. And um, it started kind of slow. The first song that we had working for it was called What's In It For Me. And that took a lot of, I mean, from where it started, the basic you know, construct of the song has always been the same, but it had kind of more of a, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, it just wasn't, it, to me, it just didn't feel like it had any kind of oof to it. It kind of plotted. And we just, you know, kept going, well, what can we do? What can we do? And then we flipped some of the chords in it. And then finally, uh, uh we changed the rhythm kind of to it and it kind of it gave it kind of get it, it went from being kind of more of a pounding kind of a thing to more of a rhythmic kind of a thing does that make any sense mm -hmm. and once we found that, that it opened up and there it was you know what i mean and that got us kind of really going but it took forever to find it i don't know why but we just kept working it and then letting it go stewing on it coming back working it but you know what i mean and um so that was really the first one we had going for what ended up becoming the obstinate record, which is this right here. Mm -hmm. and I've kept mine in the street because I got I got hyped on the hype. Oh yeah, no, we it's another record collector thing. Mine's got the shrink, mine's got the hype. That's the way we do it, folks. We're collectors. And um, as we got down into this, um once it started rolling, it started rolling real fast. We were in a, we had uh, secured another room to practice in, uh, courtesy of our friend John Hayes, who's been a big, big help for the band in the, especially in the time that I've been involved with him. He used to own Tremont Music Hall. And when he closed Tremont, he had some leftover stuff and he had to rent a, another small warehouse, basically, to store his stuff. And so he set up just, you know, he set up, basically he set up a stage in there and kind of a whole rehearsal room. And uh, we got to practice in there for a couple of years. And that was a really awesome place. And that was kind of where the we're number one came together. And then also where, you know what, I think I got, uh, I don't think I'm completely out of order here. Another record was recorded there that I think came out after Obstinate, but was recorded before Obstinate, or right around that same time. See, I'm getting a little lost. I might have I'm this I'm taking wrong. your word for it. This is during the period of time I was just getting back into the swing of things with anti-scene, so I'm, I'm very, very... I was, I think, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go by the, by the recording of the way I remember it, so we're going we're gonna to backpedal a little bit and go to this. All right, but a, very I... import, a very important record. Okay. Oh, wait. we recorded this at the old the, that practice room. We called it Tremont South because it was where all the Tremont leftover stuff went. The PA was there and uh, all that, and we recorded that in in, in that room, uh, and that became the <sighs> NIC Malcolm Tent split. 
where we covered your song, Do It Now. Yeah. And tunnel rat. a Tunnel Rat song called Don't Tell Your Mom. And uh, I remember uh, running it all down with Barry. And that came really fast. We recorded that really fast. So it's almost like a blur. And that's why I, I, I get kind of confused on it. It's like, we, you know, it's like we worked on it. I remember working on it. But I barely remember recording it. I remember practicing it more than I do recording it. Mm. Um, but it, I remember it came together really fast. And, I, you know, I thought it turned out really, really, really good. I really like Don't Tell Your Mom, too. I think that's a killer song. Yeah, man. That, that's, that's a one-two punch on that side of the record. And um, you, know, you want and to talk about... Three, four on the other. Yeah, man. Yeah. Dreams come true for both of us. This is uh, my, my copy. This hangs in my record room to this day. It's framed. And it's autographed by every person on the record. All five participants fully autographed, framed and hanging in my music room. That's how seriously I took this record and still take it. The second I got the box from the pressing plant, started assembling the sleeves, I was like, yeah, I've been waiting a long time. And it's on sweet colored vinyl, gray marble. Yep, some of that random color that I use at my pressing plant. You never know what they're going to look like. Blue. I don't know if that's blue or gray to you, but kind of a cobalt blue, gray, marbled. I don't, I don't know if you can see the marble in it because of the shine off of it. But, yep, that got us kind of back in each other's orbit, didn't it? Yeah, very much so. And um, just a little itty-bitty bit of backstory in case people haven't heard the tale yet. That song, Do It Now, I wrote during the weekend of Anti-Scene's 10th anniversary show when I was in Charlotte because I saw this billboard that said, get high, get stupid, get AIDS. Yep. You know, some kind of public service announcement billboard. So I, of course, added my own three words to it, do it now. I remember them laughing about that. They, that, that, that stuck around for a little while every time we passed by that sign. And, and I had forgotten all about it until, you know, the song popped back up, which I think I saw you do... I think you were playing that. I went to go see you in 2011 or somewhere in Fayetteville. It was the first time I'd seen you in a lot of years. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was that was my first ever set of road dates, just opening up for Anti-Scene. See, the, it all comes back to Anti-Scene. My first ever proper road gigs were opening for Anti-Scene. One weekend, we did The Wizard in Hickory, and then the next night in Fayetteville. So yeah, that, was, that was it. That was my second ever tour show, and you were there. I was at the Fayetteville one, yeah. So, but that was when we did, you know, I don't know if that record came out before or after Obstinate, but I know we, we must have recorded it before because by the time we did the writing, most of the writing for Obstinate, um, John had to close down, he had to move out of that uh, storage space, that warehouse that he had rented because it was getting torn down to be replaced by the endless. Uh, the endless construction of apartments and condos that exists here in oh, Charlotte. It's, it's a sort of new charm for the Queen City. You know, every time I go down there on band business, I'm like, oh, that, that's a nice new set of apartment buildings they've got there. And lovely condos where that landmark used to be. It, that's, that's I cool. mean, John has it worse. John Hayes had it worse because that's what Tremont got torn down for. It got raised so they could have condos. Then he moves his stuff into this other place and he got raised so they could put up more condos. It's you know that's 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 progress. Hey, I think I heard that's what it was. Yeah, it was a progress. Progress. I don't. It's I don't know. But we ended up doing the. We went old school and 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 temporarily we rented a storage unit like a like a rent a rent a storage public storage. I don't know what what they what the companies are called up north. There's a. Down here, there's like a handful of them. There's public storage. There's extra space storage. There's, I think we were in Morningstar storage. I don't remember what this place was called. But, uh, you know, this your, it was real bare bones, you know, sliding door, threw the stuff in, you know, and it was cold. I remember it was wintertime. We were working on these songs. And, uh, but once we, it was a good environment because, once you got in there, it was like there was that's all you could do, and it's like we just started really putting this stuff together. And uh, I had some riffs that I had for a long time that I had, you know just started putting those in, and um, 
so we i came up with the most of the stuff for the song static mm -hmm. um uh guts was a combination of different stuff that different people had i piss you off was mine that was an old unused mad brother ward song um law-abiding citizen jeff wrote and i can't i guess i wrote the music for that yeah I, re I remember writing the music for that atomic clock was an idea that that's probably the strangest thing on the record um that was an idea of something like me and Jeff are probably the, well now you maybe I'm not sure, but me and Jeff like jazz and we like especially like the scronky you know kind of you know he, Sun Ra like you were, you you were talking about Sun Ra earlier Absolutely. so Absolutely. you know stuff like that I like Coltrane's Ascension and my original idea was like it'd be fun if we could come up with something but it had movement it would be like kind of in different parts and we didn't end up doing that but it ended up coming out as atomic clock the uh sound bite on that where the guy talks about the atomic clock you know only satan can turn back you know a clock and make it that i recorded that in a bar one night that was a guy i met at the thirsty beaver in charlotte and he was in there one night just talking off all this crazy shit and he wasn't a regular he wasn't a guy that came in there he just wandered in and was just like you know I couldn't, I was like, I got to get some of this. And I just started filming them on my phone and I got about three different things, but that was, you know, that was the, the golden one that was, and I had it for years and years and years. And I was like, we got to use this somewhere. And then that's how I got dropped in on that. And that's how the title atomic clock came to be. Yeah. Um, that's great. And I, I, I also love, and you, you touched on this, just a second ago that, that, that's really some avant-garde weird stuff in general and that just shows you what this band is capable of doing you know i mean yes there is there are parameters yes there is a formula but one thing i love about being creative with anti-scene is it's not a straight jacket you know we can flop around in that thing and really go in some weird directions yeah you know and that's that's what's been cool about this because i think this record really takes a lot of different uh, influences and you don't really you know I did you don't think about it unless you're I guess unless you participate in it it's just cool to have like with what's in it for me it feels like I can hear a lot of like um, kind of the sort of southern soul or whatever you know Jeff likes a lot of that old 70s soul and you can hear that in his you know that's what's different about Jeff's vocal style to me is that you know, at, at a superficial level, you hear the growl and you think, you know, it's easy to just dismiss it as part of the hardcore cookie monster, blah, blah, blah. But no, Jeff has a soulful quality to his voice. He's a singer. Yeah. And, you know, and when he really throws it in there, it's fucking great. And, um, you know, why you got to be the same way we went into why you got to be. And I don't know where we came up with it. And I, I'm, I'm positive it was probably my idea, but the the wah pedal, which is something we had never done before. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's because I, I was lobbying to do that at the last round of live shows we did, and it didn't quite make the cut. And I was like, you know, it was probably because of the wah. It's that it's hard. Problem. It's a little tricky to play live because I'm not in the habit of flipping in and out on the clean and the dirty and the wah and blah blah blah. blah. And uh, but I know that 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 was a grand funk influence on that. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it, it, it comes from different places. And then Down on Me, our cover of Down on Me was my idea. And um, that was something that I had thought of 25, 30 years ago, 25 years ago anyway. Mm. I tried to sell them on doing that a long, 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 long time ago. And, uh, you know, not, you know, they, they, not any serious fashion or whatever, but it just came back to me. I was like, you know, that's something we ought to try or think about doing. And, you know, and that just kind of started to evolve and there it is. Down on me. Yeah. And, and you know what, that, that kind of provides a clue to the chronology because I remember when I started talking to Jeff about doing the, um, the split, he said that they had a version of down on me that they were going to put on this. Ah. I, was, I was slightly surprised when it ended up being don't tell your mom perfectly fine with it because it's a great tune and then this came out with down on me and i'm like ah okay they did use it for something 
Well, I don't know that uh, we, you know, we may have recorded or tried to record down on me when we did the don't tell your mom and the do it now. And it didn't, it didn't work. I don't remember now. Um, I remember um, it had, I remember I had a little feedback part at the, on the leading in on it that they had to cut out because it, it just, it was too wonky sounding once you put the vocal on it. I was really kind of bummed about it because I was like, it sounded really cool. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then uh, let's see, uh, Racist I wrote, that was sort of a reactionary song to people using terms like that as a, as a easy flip it way to, you know, silence their whatever. And I think when you do that, you tend to trivialize the importance of when you in when you encounter real racism you know what i mean does that make sense that makes a lot of sense yeah and that was what it's it was about you know. it's don't trivialize shit like that you know right. because somebody says something that's maybe off color or not cool but doesn't necessarily make them a racist or a nazi and when you use those terms you're really trivializing something that's very important and that's kind of in the long in the you know on the back end long run it's kind of a, a it's an ugly thing to do and b it's dangerous but Never mind all that. It's so racist is actually an anti-racist song. Um, so yeah, that's how we kind of came up with that. All that came together once we started, um, you know, into it. We really, really, it really fired quick. I mean, it came together really, really fast once we once we had the creative juices going and all that. So we took these photos outside that practice room i remember one afternoon we just went outside and took those out in sunlight mm -hmm. and um then of course that wound up going to the packaging deal here more cool rainy packaging and jeff too obviously yeah we got the uh the big poster which is too big for me to even put in the you know just look over my shoulder, folks. It's right here. This is the 23 poster. by 36. So there you go. Yeah. Look at that. And not only that, but a nice printed inner sleeve. Yeah. And uh, I don't even know where some of these pictures come from. Then they have the current kind of whole crew at the time with, um, you got to mention, uh, of course, Brandon, our, our uh, Brandon's our uh, roadie extraordinaire and our t-shirt and merch peddler extraordinaire, Ty Oh, God, that is Brandon. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even recognize him. <laughs> and it's on, of course, cool marbled gray vinyl. Oh, wait, let's do the comparison and contrast because, look, you've got a lighter variant and I've got a darker variant. Yeah, well, uh, mine's probably just light in the way it's lit back here. No, I think I think they're distinctly different. Let's just let's assume they are because it's more fun that way. Yeah. Well, you know, be the first on your block to own them all. Yeah, man. I love the fact that on this album, even since I joined the band, we've done five songs off of this album in the live set. We've done "What's in It for Me," "Let the Working Man Rest a Little Bit," "Guts," "I Piss You Off," and "Atomic Clock." Uh, let's see. How many have we played live since since the records come out? Before you have joined, we played uh, we've played racist. We played what's in it for me. We played static. We played working man. We played guts. Piss you off. I don't think we've played down on me live. I don't remember. We have played law abiding citizen. We haven't done atomic clock live. Well, we've used it. We've used a little bit of atomic clock as like intro, mm. and of course we played why you got me. So we've played most of this live at some point or another, yeah. and probably will continue because. Uh, you know, this I think this record's turned out to be pretty pretty popular. People seem to like it. I like it. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. And you know, when you figure when you've got an album so strong that you've played basically every song on it live, that says a lot, you know, that, that really is a testament to the power of the individual work. And yeah. This is actually, believe it or not, that the time doth fly. This is a very good point, I think, in the story to break off because we've already been at this for the little over 50 minutes, you know, close to an hour. And we're about halfway done with the Mad Brother Ward segment of the catalog. So I think we're going to break it off right now, kind of like an anti-scene song. 
and um, pick it up with the other the other part of Ant of anti scene featuring Mad Brother Ward and eventually Amalgam Ten. So, what do you think about that, Mad Brother Ward? Sounds good to me. There's still uh, there's still a lot more to cover here. Yeah, we got a few. We got a few, but we can we can do it. We can do it. So yes, that's what we will do. We'll wrap it up on the next episode of the Anti Scene Shoot interview series featuring Mad Brother Ward sitting for a record number of episodes man no one's lasted this long in the hot seat well uh hopefully uh hopefully the ratings will not decline well you better make sure they don't ward just saying <laughs> i know that's when the shrug of the shoulders it's like your arms are too short to box with god i think we can just kind of leave it at that okay no, really, we, we, we can. We can. Uh, we, we can. We will. So, yes, be sure to tune in, not only to the Anti-Scene Facebook page for plenty of shoot interviews and episodes of Break On Through, as hosted by Jeff Clayton, not only my personal page, Malcolm Tent, from Danbury, Connecticut, because I do all kinds of interviews, and I've got my Tent Talks tunes every Wednesday at 7 p.m., where I talk about records but also the anti-scene official youtube channel go there subscribe don't miss out don't be silly get in the swim and be there at the anti-scene official youtube page and of course the malcolm tent youtube page as well and we'll be back with more mad brother ward lord willing and the creeks don't rise in about 167 hours time Mad Brother Ward, thank you so much. Thanks, Malcolm. And until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.